Our scripture today is from 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Let us pray. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. Now Solomon loved to walk in the laws of his father David, and with the exception that he also sacrificed and burned incense at the shrines. The king went to the great shrine at Gibeon in order to sacrifice there. He used to offer a thousand entirely burned offerings on that altar. The Lord appeared to Solomon at Gibeon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask whatever you wish, and I'll give it to you. Solomon responded, You showed so much kindness to your servant, my father David, when he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and with a heart true to you. You've kept this great loyalty and kindness for him and have now given him a son to sit on his throne. And now, Lord my God, you've made me your servant, king in my father David's place. But I'm young and inexperienced. I know next to nothing. But I'm here, your servant, in the middle of the people you have chosen, a large population that can't be numbered or counted due to its vast size. Please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil, because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had made this request. God said to him, because you have asked for this instead of requesting long life, wealth, or victory over your enemies, asking for discernment so as to acquire good judgment, I will now give you all these. Look, I hereby give you a wise and understanding mind. There has been no one like you before now, nor will there be anyone like you afterwards. I now also give you what you didn't ask for, wealth and fame. There won't be a king like you as long as you live. And if you walk in my ways and obey my laws and commands, just as your father David did, then I will give you a very long life. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Okay, where'd I put it? There it is. I brought us a snack. <laughs> I did. I brought us a snack. You want it? Here. You want some? It's corn with dirt. <laughs> Y'all want some? Wash it. I don't Yeah, this. It's, it's leftover corn from one day, first to last week. I don't, I don't have any takers here. But the dirt's from the churchyard, so it's holy. <laughs> and and so I figure you get fiber. I think you can get like some B, extra B vitamins from the dirt. And, and there's little pieces of string or something. I don't know what that is. You want to buy it? <laughs> no? Well, all right, fine. How do you know you don't want to eat this? Want some, Emma? <laughs> How do you know you don't want to eat it? Look. You want some? Ah. It does look nasty, <laughs> doesn't it? I bet it tastes kind of gunky, too. Ew. <laughs> Smells not anything to get excited about. It is yucky. And how do you know it's yucky? It's got dirt on it. That's right. See, you, 
you have a discerning mind, you can look and tell something's icky. That's pretty good. Yeah. But you know the ability to look or to know that something is gross or icky or yucky or bad or evil or wrong, that's what Solomon asked God for. Didn't have corn. That is gross. <laughs> we'll cover that up. That's what Solomon wanted, was the ability to discern. God said, tell me what you want, and I will give it to you. And I asked the kids, what would you have said? Well, there's all kinds of answers. But Solomon showed some real wisdom and finesse in just what he asked for. He already had a little bit of good sense. He was smart enough to know that he needed help. I mean, after all, he was young. He was, some say he was only about 20. Is anybody in here 20 years old? Pete Jarvis? <laughs> We're in church. <laughs> I, can, he was about 20. When you were 20, could you imagine being king? And, and, and he was the kind of king that was always going to need to be one step ahead of everybody else. He had murdered for the throne one of his brothers. He had a bunch of brothers. And he even had the old general Joab murdered. And Joab had been very, very faithful to David. And then Solomon exiled people all the way to the throne. It was not a peaceful succession. <clears throat> so now he's king and he's gone to Gibeon, about five and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem. And he's gone to sleep and God says, tell me what you want. You know, in some ways it is just one of the examples of God's terrific sense of timing that God chooses Gibeon, and that night is the place to do that. Gibeon is one of those places where people go to worship idols or lowercase gods. They called it a god, but it wasn't. It was a rock or a piece of wood or something. Solomon was not expecting the real God to show up. God's presence that night came as a surprise. And, you know, sometimes God still works that way. You go to places where you don't expect to see God because you're going to indulge in some things and, and enjoy things that are contrary to God and will and take you further from God, and God will show up right there every time. God works that way. But this whole Gibeon thing, this eventually will be Solomon's downfall. You see, our God is awesome. Our God is magnificent and wonderful and jealous. God does not put up with people wandering around calling other things God and giving to other things the devotion and the worship that properly belong to God. God does not share. And it is Solomon's fatal flaw that he is not able to be entirely faithful to God. Now, David messed up in all kinds of ways, but David only worshipped God. Solomon, well, that's a whole different story. At Gibeon, he has made a thousand offerings at the time to idols and stuff. And later on, he's going to raise up Asherah poles and, and participate in the worship of who knows what all just to please his many wives and concubines. By the way, do you know how many of those he had? 900. Can you imagine? But here in, at Gibeon, he has pleased God by asking for a discerning heart. 
That's a very good thing to have. Because it's more than intellect. It's the heart too. The other night on Jeopardy, one of the questions, or maybe it was the answer, I forget how it was exactly worded. But it was about the character from the Wizard of Oz who when receiving a brain said a very mangled and incorrect sentence that was supposed to be the Pythagorean theorem. It was the scarecrow. He's the one with the brain. As soon as he got that brain, he began to babble math. He said, the sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh joy, oh rapture, I've got a brain. Give it back. <laughs> it's defective. <laughs> I remember enough geometry to know that it's A squared plus B squared is C squared. It's a right triangle and all that. But you know, I've watched The Wizard of Oz for years, and I've never caught that. And guess what? I don't care. I still enjoy the movie. But we do need to learn things, and we need to stretch our intellect. But we must also have discerning hearts that will help us in our perception of knowing who we are and who God is, to whom be we belong and what that means. Having a discerning heart allows us to know our own value in eternity, our own worth, that God, the creator of heaven and earth, has declared you personally, not just all oh, y'all, but you personally worthy of the blood of his own begotten son. Only begotten son. Having that discerning heart means that you know that and it means that you seek out and find in response ways that you can make a difference in God's name. Ways that you can be a part of the coming kingdom. When you help someone else. I saw a discerning heart in a Sunday school class this morning. When one of our youngest children reached over to help a toddler open a magic marker. She just smiled really sweet and said, let me help you with that. And opened it up. That's a discerning heart. Seeing someone else's need and making a difference. The late Henry Nowen told of a visit that he made to see Trevor, who was a mentally ill patient at a hospital in Toronto. He called the chaplain before and said, I'm going to come and make sure everything was okay. And the chaplain said, well, let's have a little luncheon and we'll invite some of the other priests and the staff members. And that was fine. That's fine. And, and, but there was some mix-up as to whether Trevor would get to attend or not because no patient had ever been in the dining room. But now and would not go without Trevor So the because that going to see Trevor was why he was there. So Trevor got to go, and it was a very boring luncheon. It was quiet, and it was solemn, and it was not fun. You ever been to one of those? Well, Trevor was sitting there bored, and he asked, could I have a Coca-Cola, please? So they got up and got him a Coke. And then, page 65, from Can You Drink the Cup, he took his glass of Coke, lifted it, and said with a loud voice and a big smile, ladies and gentlemen, a toast. And everyone dropped their conversation and turned to Trevor with puzzled and anxious faces. Now one says he could read their thoughts. What in the heck is this patient going to do? Better be careful. But Trevor had no worries. He looked out at everybody and said, lift up your glasses. And everyone obeyed. And then as if it was the most obvious thing in the world to do, he started to sing, when you're happy and you know it, lift your glass. 
When you're happy and you know it, lift your glass. When you're happy and you know it, 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 and you lift your glass. And as he sang, people's faces relaxed and started to smile. Soon a few joined Trevor in his song, and not long after, everybody was standing and singing loudly under Trevor's direction. Trevor's toast radically changed the mood of the golden room. He brought these strangers together and made them feel at home. His beautiful smile and his fearless joy broke down the barriers between staff and patients and created a happy family of caring people. That's what a discerning heart does. It finds a way to make a difference, to make us one in Christ, to make us feel safe, to make us closer to God. Today is the day of those, one of those new beginning kind of days when after this things won't ever be quite the same. Some of you are going to first grade this year. It's not going to be the same. Or second or third, fourth or fifth or high school or junior high. It's not junior high, middle school. Some of you will see a child go off to school for the first time, or your grandchild will be in a senior this year. It's going to be different. For all of us, we are headed into new experiences. Maybe you're going to retire this year. Maybe you're going to make a new friend. Maybe you're going to say goodbye. But in all these things, may God bless you with amazing gifts to know things and with a discerning heart to make a difference in the name of Christ. Amen.